Okay, and now we'll get on to the, the main event here. I'm really excited. Tonight's speaker is Stephen Cohn. Uh, I met Stephen in October. We both spoke at a product event, product event in the city. I loved what he had to say about real examples and lessons learned of applying Lean Startup at his own startup, Validately. So he's CEO of Validately. He's a serial entrepreneur. His former startups have been acquired by TripAdvisor and Living Social. Um, he's also worked at DoubleClick, Quantcast, and IBM. Went to Business School at Harvard. He's basically a Lean Startup expert. So I'm really excited to have Stephen. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, and by the way, he flew out from New York for this. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Uh, I, I don't. I don't consider myself a, a lean expert. I, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about um, a, a real case study. Uh, I'm going to share. I'm going to try to be as candid as possible. That's my natural personality. Um, if if you want even more specifics, ask me. Uh, if I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't, I'll tell you. I don't know it. Um, and I'll walk you through uh, basically kind of uh, how we used uh, Lean to build uh, my current startup. So the, the background to that, to my current startup was, uh, as Dan mentioned, I had uh, I did get the entrepreneurial bug, um, and uh, it started in 2007. And uh, at my first my first company uh, worked out well. We we sold it, and uh, basically created what you know as Living Social today. Uh, so the Daily Deals product was uh, born out of my product uh, that was acquired from, from Living Social. Um, and it turned out to, it was one of those things where, you know, um, we had a, a commerce solution, they had a big Facebook app, we put it together and just hockey sticked. Uh, um, and it turned out to be you know, a good, good story. My second startup uh, was, even though we, we sold it to TripAdvisor, very candidly was not a good outcome. Um, and it was the frustration born out of that experience that made me dive in deep into lean. I felt like in that experience I felt like I got a lot of false positives and um, uh, it was excruciatingly painful and um, and uh, I, I wanted to I, I really wanted to figure out uh, you know how, how we can avoid these things how, how you know why talk to, I, I interviewed product managers um, yeah, you know, I, I, what I consider leading companies. I spoke to them, talked to them. How do you do this now? What did we learn? I read basically everything, um, and st and then we basically started started implementing it. So what I'm going to give you today is uh, is a case study on how we how we use lean, um, what we did literally from from day one. Okay, that's that's the agenda. Um, and if you think anything I say is interesting, you can find me at SP Cone, uh, and our company is at Validate. All right, so, so pre-process, like once I kind of, like, I, I sat down with the team, we were a very small team, and, um, and I said, okay, first thing we want to do is, uh, is actually read the book. It's amazing how many people you talk to who uh, either don't read the book or read the first couple chapters and then say, oh, I got it. Um, and, but then you ask them some questions, you talked about it, and they don't do it. And so my thing is, look, if, if this is going to be our principle, if this is going to be our, everyone should be speaking the same language. We should understand what it what it is, and then and so I literally gave people several days off. I said, just focus on this. Read the book. Think about it. Take some notes. We're going to come back and we're going to discuss it. And that's what we did. We we put together um, <clears throat> what I'm you know visually showing is the Ten Commandments. But basically, what we did is the rules of the road. Now, why do we, do, we so we literally we documented in writing, in a shared Google Doc, so everyone could see. The, rule, the key principles and the rules of the road of how we're going to follow these certain things. And this is important for a number of reasons, one of which is founders uh, are type A, they're very confident people, um, and I mean, I, you, know, you know, they'll say, you know, it's like um, uh, uh, with Alcoholics Anonymous, you have to say, I'm, I'm Steven, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic, but I'm an overbuilder. I love building stuff. I just think it's cool. I think technology's cool. I love seeing cool things interact on the site. I just think it's cool. The problem is, is customers, while they might think it's cool, don't necessarily need what, what we build. And so I'm an overbuilder. And, and so having my team have documentation of, look, these are the rules of the road. These are the, these are the things that we've agreed to before we even got started. 
allowed them to call bullshit. Allowed them to say, push back on me and say, Stephen, you said before we started this that we're going to follow these approach. Now you're telling us to just build something because you think it looks cool. Um, that's not that's not what we agreed to. So it's a check on everyone on the team. You, you, you read everything, you got on the same page, and now we document it, we put it together, and we say, okay, these, this is how we're going to act as a team. I think it, it was a very important foundation that we laid uh, as a team to, to be able to work functionally. And they, they actually did call um, bullshit on me early on, and, um, and it worked. Um, so so I, believe in, I believe in that. Uh, and then we said, okay, what are, we started with this ideation process. <clears throat> right, so what, what are the, we going to build? And so I gave everyone another day off, and I said, focus on, come back and, and let's think about real pain points that need to be solved, problems that need to be solved. And, and we don't need to think about it for too long because if it's a true problem, you can think about it. And then everyone came back as a team. They put together a little one-pager and said, okay, this is, this is a problem I think needs to be solved. And, here's it. and they pitch it to, to me as the founder. Now, uh, <clears throat> one of the key things that you, know, you have to do is the founder has to really truly empathize with the product, has to empathize with the problem. Um, so one of, the, one of the people came back with a great idea, which I still think might be a good business. Um, his idea was he spoke to his, his wife, and his wife had this pain point that she said she, she looks at her closet, and everything in the closet, she has a lot of stuff in the closet, but she, has, she never can figure out in the morning what to wear. It's a real pain in the butt. She would love to have like a, a, a clothing consultant, just that she can, an app that, that can make a suggestion for her. And I said, that, you know, that sounds like a great idea. Now, I wouldn't hire myself to run that company if like I was hiring, because I don't know, I, you know, I wear jeans every day. My wife buys my clothes for me. Like, I don't know anything about, like, I just go down the next shirt in the dry cleaner. So I, I don't. I'm not the person to build and run a startup because I can't empathize with that. Um, so good idea, maybe a good business. I don't, you know, we, we didn't even get into the business model. Maybe a good business, but not, not right for me. Okay, um, and so we went through that process, and uh, an engineer on our team, and everyone does it. So it's not just top down. Um, everyone does it. So one of the engineers on our team actually came up with an idea that was basically similar to. Uh, an idea that I had, um, and that was the seeds of what we did. But but by going through that process, uh, the, it, there was a lot of team buy-in. So we went through this process to, to kind of figure out the, the right pain point. We did research. We narrowed it down to two or three ideas. Uh, then we did research on that. Um, and when we were doing our research, you know, I say this is what what you're looking for. Um, you know, so I'll say you you want to you want to find a pain point, right? And if, if what I've found in starting companies is if you identify a pain point, you say to someone, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem. If it's a real problem, something that it really just triggers something in them, they will talk to you. They will take time out of their day to, to talk to you and help you understand what it is. Uh, and, and their idea is that they've probably already thought of a like, best way to, to, to solve that problem. If you don't have a pain point, you hear stuff like, that looks awesome, that's great. I can't find any time right now. I'm swamp, I'm like crazy swamp. But um, definitely email me when you have some. I'd love to take a look. Right? Or, oh, I have a friend who might be interested. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll tell them about your site, and uh, I'll have them go there. You know? Stuff like that, false positives. Um, so, but if you, if you really find something, it'll come out in the interviews. Right? So you'll start talking to these people. and. Uh, how do you do this now? You know, why do you do it this way? Why do you need this? Right? Um, what do you hate about what, what, what you're doing? And how much value would it be uh, if it was solved? They will tell you. They will, they will give you real things. And, and it'll be clear. If you're listening, if you're truly objectively listening, it'll be clear if you're truly solving a problem. Now, now here's the thing. As passionate as people are, about <clears throat> this problem. It's great, but you can't just stop at listening to them. You have to get some sort of skin in the game from them, some sort of commitment, something that says, what I just told you, I really am willing to follow up with you. Now, in my experience, I think there's three, four, there's three levels of commitment you can get from someone, and I think it, and it escalates. So the first is your time. 
are you will is this really serious enough that you're willing to give me your time on a website we call it engagement in, in customer interviews we call I, I, I say you give me your time okay are you coming back are you willing to come back and, and so at the end of our interviews um, well the, the second thing is your reputation so that's the next level up are you willing to give me your reputation what I mean by that are you willing to tell a friend invite a friend or tweet it out or do something socially where you're putting your reputation on the line on my behalf for no reason but that you think what we're doing is great just met with this team they're doing something awesome tweet right or I have three guys I they are gonna be killed to, to solve this problem can we set up a meeting with those three guys so your reputation is now on the line that's more important pe than people than their time and the last the last validation is, is your check but uh, uh, this early on is, is you're not ready to ask, ask for a check so it's so you don't want to ask for a check until you until you're ready okay um, now the key thing here is and this is this is what I, one of the things I learned in my sales training at IBM uh, one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs or product people or non-sales people will make is they'll get a commitment verbally without something specific and tangible. Would you meet with me again? Yeah, totally. Just email me when you're when when it's live. That's not a commitment. Okay? Here's what I do. Will you meet with me again? Yes. Awesome. Let me, let, do you have your calendar on you? Yeah, great. So um, uh, like mon the Monday the ne in, in two weeks? Boom. Literally put it in. Oh, can I have your email so I can just send you a calendar invite? You'll see the reaction to their face change. That's, that'll tell you something. The people, so a, f a fraction of those people will, will, will ah, ooh, ah, ah, my kid's sick that day, right? Um, <laughs> that's fine. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for no. You're, you want to hear no. No saves you time. The problem, the enemy that you all face are false positives. It's not no. But what we're pre-wired to avoid no. We're all successful people. You guys are all successful people. That's why you, 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 you've achieved at this point. And so, so hearing no is painful. Uh, it, when, you, when you're a salesperson, uh, you hear no all the time, so you get, you get over that pretty quickly or you don't stay in sales. But if you're not trained in that way, uh, you're hearing no, you, you find ways to avoid no. And so you don't even ask the question. But if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a product person building something, you have to, you have to be okay that, with that. I call it seek the no. You have to seek the no. You have to be okay. And the only way you know is if you're asking for something hard in return, skin in the game, there has to be something with teeth to what you just, to back up what you just said. And if, you, and if it's not, discount everything they just said. Completely irrelevant. Wipe it from your memory bank. Don't think that I'm just going to go build what he said, come back to him, and it's going to be a yes. It wasn't. It's not a yes. You're, if you're going to chase your tail. You're going to chase false positives. If they're not willing to stay in the game with you, then, then they're not really interested in your problem. And if they are, they, then, then, then they are. Now, if what they said matches up, or even though if they say no, um, matches up with a bunch of people that said yes, Okay, okay, they're, they're not early adopters, but I hear the same exact problem and pain point over here with the, with the people who are staying engaged, great. So, so when you're doing your customer interviews, you're looking for pain, it's really, really clear when you find it. You want to, wanna, you, want, you, want to feel, you want to feel it coming through the phone. Feel it coming through, like you want to see the, the face, their face get red and, and, and passionate about uh, what, you're, what you're talking about and the problem that it solves for them. And then you have to back that up with some level of commitment from them. And the three steps are your time, your reputation, and your money. All right, so, so we did that. We said, okay, um, the victor was, um, was around solving this problem for product teams around, around false positives. So uh, we did, you know, with the, one of the, with the classic first MVPs, um, uh, you know, is, is a simple landing page. And we, we, bought, um, we bought ads on LinkedIn, targeted to product managers, um, and drove people to this landing page that's very ugly. Um, and we had it designed uh, uh, <laughs> on um, 99 designs, and we, we built it in LaunchRock. 
Um, it took us about um, uh, it took us about 15 minutes to put together, as you can tell. Uh, but this was the first thing that we wanted to test, and what we wanted to test is uh, people that we didn't know. So that's another thing that happens with with products is I, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time. It's amazing. Um, this, it's the same things for for, for for first timers. Oh, I told everyone. I talked to like all these people I know, and they love it. They're like, oh, I totally use that product, man. It's awesome. Um, don't talk to people you know. Okay. The key thing you have to do is, is validate with, with, with uh, real customers that you don't know. And, and the, most, the purest test is can you drive a click, a targeted click, into a landing page for a company they've never heard of, even if it's an ugly landing page that just says a simple value prop statement, and is that value statement enough to get them to give you their time and their personal inf information with the, with the email? Okay? Um, that's the first test. And so we did that, and we actually had pretty good conversion rates. Uh, so, oh, but uh, interesting. So the first time we ran it, we had no one clicking on the ad on LinkedIn. We're like, oh boy, this is not good. Um, and then we found um, somehow uh, one of our, our, our junior marketing guy found the um, if you add a, an image of a female uh, in your it's just, it's it's, uh, it's data, it's not, uh, you know, if you add a, a, an image of a female, a professional looking female in your, um, in your, uh, in your ad on LinkedIn, click rates go up. And it actually, that's exactly what happened. So the same exact copy that got zero clicks, as soon as we, we, we went to Google, you know, search did for, you know, a businesswoman and added two images, we downloaded, put it up, ran the ads and started getting clicks at, at actually three times the average click rate for LinkedIn. So like the, the LinkedIn manager like emails like what are you guys doing? You guys are great. Your performance is phenomenal. Like, <laughs> we're not even a company yet. Um, so 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 that was like you know it, sometimes you get false negatives too that you know you have to, you keep iterating on that side of stuff. So we did that and we had a whole bunch of people sign up and like oh crap we haven't built anything yet. What are we going to show? Them? So um, <clears throat> so what we did is we quickly threw together a, a single use case. Now, we were, actually, I was just talking about this pre-meeting, uh, a gentleman over there. Um, on the, the key thing with an MVP uh, is, is it's, it's a test. And just like you, you learned in the scientific method in, 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 in high school, when you are testing something, you have to isolate a single variable that you're testing, something specific that you're testing. If you're testing eight different variables at once, you don't know what is actually causing the result that you're getting or counteracting a result that you might be getting. So you test a single use case. You don't test a whole product early on. And again, you're seeking the no. You're seeking, you're, if someone said yes to this, I'd be like, you're lying to me. I mean, come on, this is not a product. Why do you hate this? Why is this not enough? Tell me what, you know, what, what it is. It's a single use case. This was just a, a thing that we threw together. You could, like, it, there was nothing behind it. There was no code. It was literally done in a day with HTML um, where you could, you could put a, a, a web page or a photo or a, a video on the left, and it was a single URL that you could email out to someone with a question. They could look at that and, and answer a question. So like a very simple survey type thing. And, but part, we call it a product page, and you can create a, a, a feature page. And so you can create a feature page and get that to people and have them answer that, and you would, you would tabulate all the results against that feature page. Um, and what we heard was obviously that's not a product. Um, and so what we heard was why is that, what are the problems that you're looking for? Okay, why, why can you not use this as a product uh, to solve your pain? And what you're looking for You know what? What you're looking for is is uh, consistencies, okay? And then and then as you hear, start to see things, okay, then you say, okay. Now we started to hear people I'm trying to connect. I'm sorry, it's not connecting. Um, we started to hear consistent patterns from people, and so we said, okay. Um, let's actually put a back end behind this and put it in front of people, because we had some people say, 
you know, I, I need this, but I can, I can definitely use this. So, okay, all right, let's, te let's test it. Um, and so we spent like a week, literally, not much, and we put something together, and then we sent it to people. Um, and uh, and, uh, and we, we, we learned uh, from, from them uh, on, on certain things. So, so this is what, like, actually, so, so that we, we, we built it in March. We put a first version out in, in, in early April. Um, still around this feature page concept, <clears throat> but um, it was it was based off of it, uh, off of patterns. So the thing I'll say later on um, as a slide is, you know, we would never build something until we heard that same thing. Oftentimes, the exact same terminology, uh, you know, ten to twelve times. So we would we would, we would always always want to hear that consistent pattern of, I could use this if this piece was, was there, uh, on a, uh, you know, multiple times. And we did that, we learned that before we actually built something. And again, these people were staying engaged with us. We weren't a company. We weren't paying them anything. We're not paying them $50 every time they meet us. They're staying engaged with us, which that's, a, that's another way to get false positive, right? Keep giving out candy, right? I mean, we learned that as a young, young kid. You will say anything to get, you know, to get candy. That's why dentists give me, give me you know, candy at the end of your, your thing. So, um, or they give you toys or whatever. Um, so, so um, these people are coming back. They're staying engaged. They're, so, there's fall off along the way. So, so, so we, 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 you know, we want to see why they're falling off. Every, after every time, after every iteration, we're like, you know, will you stay engaged with us? Will you keep coming back? Do you know someone... So now we're testing the second level. Do you know someone who also would be interested in this? Yes. Okay, can you invite them and CC me and so I can set up a meeting with them? Um, so we're going through. Okay. And, and one of the things we're, we're doing as we're doing this is I'm learning funnel metrics. Now, uh, most product people... Uh, you know, I, I, see, I hear this all the time about, you know, they, they, they have very a lot of product people, a lot of entrepreneurs, very uncomfortable when the concept of sales comes into, into the discussion. I'm not a sales guy. Well, what's a sales guy? Well, you know, they're a very fast talker and they're very smooth. And, um, and you know, it's Glenn Gary, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And, and, and the reality is, is um, you better get comfortable with it. You better get comfortable understanding your funnel metrics and what it's going to take to actually close uh, close a customer, whether it's uh, consumer or B2B, um, you need to understand price point. You need to be testing price early on. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to an entrepreneur, and they even have beta customers. And I ask them, you know, how much are you going to charge for this yet? We're like, well, we're not sure. It's either going to be, you know, uh, $100 a month or, you know, $10,000 a month. Well, <laughs> have you spoken about to your customer? No, not yet. We're, we want to get them comfortable with it. You haven't even asked your customer yet? Kind of important because a ten thousand dollar a month solution is a lot different than a hundred dollar a month solution, right? And the and the go to market is a lot different, but the product is different. What you're building, what you're delivering, the solution you're providing, the value you're providing is a very different thing. You better understand that early on, because again, that's how you end up overbuilding and having the problem of you have a ten thousand dollar solution and a plan on how you're going to sell that ten thousand dollar a month solution, and in your mind's eye, the customer, it's a hundred dollar a month problem. And so you need to validate this all, all the way through. What are those funnel metrics? How are we going to go from a click to a landing page to a demo to actually you know, an engaged customer and understand what those are? And it is your problem to solve. It is something that you need to understand uh, you know, uh, the go to market. Um, and it's, it's something that's testable, right? So as you, as, you change, as you change the product, as you change the value statement, you're constantly testing that value statement, understanding what it's going to take to keep, uh, what, what is getting a, a, better, a better next step conversion rate, okay? Um, and again, as you're doing this, right, so you're, you're putting this together, you're constantly talking to customers, you're, you're, put, you're iterating on, on product, you're putting out new versions, you're looking for patterns, uh, six to ten people saying the same thing, building it, delivering it, are you using it now? Why not, right? And because most of the time, customers, even sophisticated customers in a B2B setting, won't know um, that second level reason why, you know, until they see what's in front of them, right? And so, the, you know, the key is to try to do this as, as 
you know, the key of lean and the whole concept of, of concierge MVP is to figure this out as effortlessly as possible with as little coding and as little time lag as possible. Okay? And so, so you know, sometimes you can put stuff in front of people um, and uh, that hasn't, it's not even working yet. It's still in a prototype stage. But you're, what you're looking for is you're looking for patterns and, and you're looking for, for reactions to, that, to, those, to that, um, that specific use case that you're, you're trying to solve for. Okay? Um, and I, I can't emphasize enough, um, don't build off of one or two people's things. You know, look, wait and, 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 and validate through uh, consistent feedback and you will hear it. You will hear consistent things. And the thing, you know, the, the, you know, the thing that every, you know, the reason why is, at the end of the day, I, I firmly believe every great product has basically one big needle moving feature. Something that just is the killer feature, the killer thing that just, you know, all the other stuff supports that killer thing. Uh, maybe a second, you know, killer feature, but there's like a killer use case, a killer thing that, that is, is there, and that's really what you need early on. That's going to be enough to keep them over there, and the only way you're going to do that is if you stay focused on the big things that you hear consistently and don't keep scrambling on all the little things. Because again, it's okay to have fall off and understand at this point in the product. You know, you're going to have some people leave. You want to understand why they're leaving and you don't want to uh, scramble to keep them uh, if, if ultimately what they're looking, they might not know what, what they're looking for until they get into your product and then it's just not the right fit for our organization, for our type of organization. Um, you know, uh, one thing I didn't, I didn't mention early, uh, early on is, is uh, the whole concept of customer archetypes. So, um, you know, we did that early, very early on. I'm a big believer in that. Um, you guys know what archetypes are? Basically, uh, customer segmentation, so skeletons. So, you know, um, you know, the target mom is the quintessential customer archetype, right? Um, but, but, you know, uh, you basically create skeletons of, of customers. So, in a, in a B2B setting, it would be, you know, e-commerce, mid-sized e-commerce, uh, you know, uh, a product uh, with, you know, X to, you know, X to Y monthly uniques or, or uh, you know, uh, whatever, single product company, you know, and then you could have multi-product company um, and different archetypes because they have different, they have different org structures, etc. So you create these archetypes and you're testing and you're validating against all the different archetypes and you're keeping feedback against all these different archetypes throughout. And you're looking for the patterns against the archetype because some of these people, frankly, you're not going to serve. Okay, as you go through this process, you're going to say, okay, some of these are really attractive segments, and we're going to solve those problems, the problems for those those patterns that we hear against that. This other segment, it's all over the place. I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing a consistent pattern from from this group. Not a problem we're solving. Um, and then, and then you get to the third level of escalation, right? So the third level is when you first start getting paying customers. So someone calls you up or emails you, and like, how do I put my credit card you know, up, on, up on the thing? And, and that's, where, that's where the rubber starts to hit the road. That's where they've, they've actually not only given you their time, they've given you the reputation because they've confirmed it with their boss, um, and, uh, and now they've given you their money. And, and so they're, they're saying, this is solving a problem. You're validating the price point. Now, I believe in doing this very early on. This whole concept of a f free beta that you can just come in and use, and then we'll just chart and we'll figure out the price later on because we just want to have people. I just I don't believe that. I think it's a terrible decision. I'll tell you why. Team, you optimize to the goal that you set, and if the goal is to get people to use a free product, you optimize to that. If the goal is to get people to use, to use a paying product that you're going to ultimately be the right price point for you, that's what you optimize to. And if, if those are often different, different bars that you need to cross. And you need to fit, because free is not a good business model, so you need to figure out early on what, what it's going to take to cross that bar on the, on the, on the paid thing. Um, so, so, you know, really important to start that early on. And... Um, uh, and I can't tell you how many product, product teams I, I hear, I meet with, they don't talk about price point, they give this free beta period. Uh, the other thing is um, they like to keep things behind like this gated 
thing. So, like, God forbid someone sees an unfinished product, you know, um, I mean, what, do you think the, what do you think they're going to do? I mean, I, I always say, like, let me ask you a question. Like, if you use a product, if you hear about a product that's really awesome and people are raving about it and say it's awesome, and you go in, you take a look, and it's actually a great product, would you really care that six months ago it was not a great product? I mean, you're going to come in, and you're going to, and by the way, it's a pretty significant market, so, so 15 people are going to be your customers, even if they don't want to come back. You know, you know it, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not worth the trouble of gating. It's better to see what people will come in and actually use the product um, and, uh, and go from there. And, and, and so, you know, I do this now, even now we have, we have you know, actual real paying customers, but like e even, even very early on, uh, you just, you, 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 you personalize the relationship with your customers. You're not just using a product, you're, you're, you're working, you know, with a team and, and you work closely with those customers. You respond quickly to bugs. People, uh, uh, you know, I found people will look past bugs very quickly if you respond quickly to them. You know, especially if you're a startup and you're a founder and you reach out to them and say, hey, you know, we're working hard, you know, please tell us if you find some things, we'll, we'll, we'll bang it out real quick. People, oftentimes people are like amazed at how quickly you fix things. And you actually get, you actually get points for, for, for being so responsive. Um, but you do that because you manage your customers closely, you manage those relationships closely. And, um, uh, and, and that'll help you get through some of the bumps that you're absolutely going to have. You're going to have product bumps along the way, things are going to break, it's technology. But if you, have, if you build a relationship with your customers, they will absolutely look past that and they'll work with you and they'll actually help you proactively. Um, so, so, so we did all that and we said, okay, um, we, it was painful, but we basically had this kind of like this, this like early, early alpha and we were kept iterating on it and we learned some things and then we stopped. We said, you know what? We need to build, so we need, we, we, now we have a good sense of what solution we need to build and it's non-trivial, okay? Um, and so we, we basically used the entire Q3 uh, to, to, to build it. And we started with code line one. We didn't use any of the legacy stuff um, because that brings problems with it too. And we only brought into the product the things that we thought needed to, you know, needed to be into the product. Okay? Um, and um, we stayed engaged with the customers throughout. I was talking to them and, and staying engaged with them um, and, and telling them what we're doing. And of course they're happy that we're still solving this problem, we're trying to fix it. Um, and, then, and then you relaunch. And relaunch is just a way of, uh, it's a marketing event. Hey, take a fresh look at us, we, we've completely changed the product, right? Um, all, that, all that historical stuff that you were frustrated about, take another look. And we found a, a very good res uh, response rate to that. People uh, you know, uh, would come back in, take a look, um, and, stay, and stay engaged with us. Now there was definitely some fall off, um, but, uh, but we did that. We had you know, a little bit better design, a little better look, we put a little more attention into, into visual, uh, visual design at that point, um, and, and definitely usability. Um, and, and, and really at that point started to focus on our value problem. Um, and, and what I would do is literally personally onboard customers. So reach back out to those people and hey, I'm the founder, love to walk you through the product uh, and, and help you get started to be successful. Right? Who would say no to the founder trying to help you be successful for something that you're interested in? Um, and so we'd set up, set up meetings and it's part usability test for me, so I'd actually see them you know, get confused. Um, I'd see where they run into roadblocks, right? Um, and, uh, and it also was kind of relationship, relationship building as well. Um, and, and, then, and then you scramble uh, like hell to, 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 fix, to fix the blockers. So basically what happens is at, at a certain point, it's a lot of stops and starts. Most of these overnight successes um, take years to, t to happen. Um, it's because what happens is, is the overnight success is like the, the fourth iteration that finally they, they, they've killed all the blockers, right? So all the reasons why I can't use that product, and I don't know until I actually get in and start trying to use it, um, 
you know, is it, once you once you've removed those blockers, the 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 reasons why that they, they can't use it and engage as, as deeply as they as they want to or as you want them to have been removed. Uh, then all of a sudden, that's when you start to see you know the growth rate. And so, uh, in personally onboarding and staying and finding those those roadblocks, and then going back to the team and say, okay, so here's we're hearing some consistent patterns, some things that are like. We like this, but, you know, and again, we don't build until we hear it consistently. Um, we, we test and validate with them before we build. We test and validate prototypes and designs with them before, before we build. Understand, you know, the reaction to it afterwards. Um, and then we fix these blockers. And then, of course, what do we do? <clears throat> we relaunch. Uh, in this relaunch, we, um, we, uh, um, uh, we rebranded as well. Uh, we put a lot more attention into visual design, um, and um, and we've 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 removed a lot of blockers, but we're still we're still finding blockers. So more more customers are coming in. They're telling us, like, ah, oh, this is great, but I, I, I this is I, I need this piece because it's just too much work to not have this piece and do all these other things. So we're 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 just systematically working through and 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 trying to kill those those product blockers. And we, we've done, well, the great thing about this process is if you go through this process, you emerge with customers, your early customers. You also emerge with an understanding of who your customers are, who your customers are not, which is very important as well. Um, and so it's always like, how do you find your first customers? Well, if, you know, if you're behind the covers, you know, behind this, this, uh, you know, uh, this big, this big gate, and you, and you don't know who your customers are. You're not engaging. You're just building things because you think they look cool, and then you release it to the public, and it's crickets. Well, you, you know, you, you know, it, you don't know who your customers are yet at that point. You're you're scrambling to find them. But if you go through this, which is basically customer discovery and customer development, you emerge at the other side with customers who are deeply engaged and emotionally bought into it because they've worked with you. To build it, and I have some great examples of, of customers that we have that 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 saw some of the earliest versions and tried some of the earliest versions, and as we kept coming back to them with with better versions and better versions, and them saying no, but no, but, and now they're like, love it, love it. I'll be a, I'll be your public case study at this point. So we have three customers. We just launched in March. We already have three customers who have committed to a publicly facing case study with us because those three customers. We're working with us very early on. They've emerged through the process. They've grown with us. They've seen our, our, our thing, and they, they, they basically we built a solution that it solves a real problem for them, and it actually has metrics behind it. And as you all know, if you have, if you have public-facing case studies, that's, you know, that's a real huge, uh, real huge thing you have shown ROI. Um, so, um, so, Last slide, uh, the, the uh, best practices, uh, I think. Um, this is my, again, my opinion. This is, um, this is what I've learned. Uh, again, require commitment from a customer after every meeting. It's not that hard. You just have to emotionally get over that. And, and you have to be comfortable with hearing them say no. And you want to see their facial reaction when you ask for that, ex that commitment. And that's be specific. If you're too vague, they, you won't get that reaction. Confirm pricing early and often. Uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, continuous deployment. Um, uh, I think that developers um, get a greater sense of, of ownership when um, when they when they say when they say it's ready. So we didn't have a QA department. You know, you can't just throw it over the wall to the business people. Like, if it, you know, you built something, you said it's working, you've tested it, push it, you know? And then when something breaks, that it's clearly theirs, and a customer complains, like in a customer email, I mean, you can see the facial reaction from them as well, right? So uh, I believe that, I believe in continuous deployment. The guys who, who I, think, I think the people who invented this or, or made it popular is the Etsy team. Um, the code is craft, you guys know about that? I just think that's gold. If you guys, if you have any interest in, in, in this subject, uh, go to Etsy's blog, Code is Craft, and they talk all about continuous deployment and um, 
and I just think it's, it's, it's really brilliant. But I think there's a psychological benefit to it as well. Not just that you ship things faster, um, but I think there's a psychological and an ownership benefit to it. Um, don't worry about visual designs early, uh, focus, but do focus on usability. The reason I say that is because it's hard to design something beautiful and make it really interactive and, and sexy. Um, not only is it hard, it takes time to get the design right. It takes time to code it. Um, and at the end of the day, what you want to test right now is value. Right? You can always make something prettier and more attractive and, and, and uh, visually compelling. But at the end of the day, if it's not solving a real problem, uh, you're going to see false positives. You're going to see people enjoy the interaction and the sexiness, but they're going to fall off. Th those people are not going to stick with you as customers. And what you want to understand is underlying, underlying what, you're, what you're doing, is this really a problem, an enduring problem that you're trying to solve, that they're going to stay with you. And then you can layer in. Uh, and if they can't do it for usability, that's a different story. Because you know you can't use it, you can't use it. But visually, um, you can add in that layer later on. Uh, listen for patterns, then build. And the last one is delete code. <clears throat> I, we love to, I love to delete code. I love it. I mean, I, I'll tell you a specific example. When we went from version 2 to version 3, we deleted 50% of our code. Deleted it. Gone. No legacy stuff. Only the stuff that made it into version 3 was the stuff that people really used and wanted. And it didn't matter that we already built it. Because the problem, and I don't care if one person was actually using that one feature. Because the problem is, is that stuff breaks. <laughs> and so you got to fix it. And if it's not adding, and it adds clutter. And, you know, and so it adds clutter, you, you get the usability and the visual wrong, right? And if, you, if, you, if, if, it, if it breaks and you got to fix it, now you're distracted from the needle moving things. And if you focus on just the needle moving things, you can add some of those pieces back in uh, later strategically, but honestly, what will happen is people might say an email or something like that af afterwards, but the non-needle needle moving thing, they're not, they're not going to fall off because of that. those things aren't there. And so literally, I, I fundamentally believe in, don't comment out the code, literally delete it. Um, delete it from, from, your, from, from the code base and completely remove it. Um, and keep that, uh, co constantly keep that uh, code clean. Um, and that took me a while to, to, to figure out because I'm not a developer. Um, and, but, and so when they were saying, like, we need to refactor, I was like, oh, that seems like a really inefficient use of time because I want to add new features. Why are you refactoring? But if you keep a clean code base, um, you can move a lot faster and things, fewer things break. Um, so that's all I got for you. I hope that was entertaining. I hope you learned something. Uh, happy to answer any questions for you. You talked about the customer archetypes and patterning identification. Was it difficult or was it you know, obvious what you saw? That, uh, the, the pattern was, where it was easy to identify them or was it like you know, different customer segments or archetypes were pulling in different directions or looking at the data? Was like, the, the, customers that are, the, the customer archetype that demands your product the most will be very obvious. But if you're not disciplined in setting those archetypes up ahead of time and looking for feedback against those archetypes and segmenting that, um, then it's, it's, it's a, it can be a little confusing. Um, and so what you're also looking for is, let's say you have an archetype and 90% of the people you know, want something, and, but 10% you know, of the people or don't want it, but 10% of the people really want it, and they're, they're very vocal, and they're pulling you in a bit of a different direction that's not really important. You should make a strategic decision that, look, I'm not going to serve that customer, right? It's very important early on that you figure out who your real customers are that are going to be your earliest adopters and solve the problem for them, right? Only solve the problem for them. Stay focused on those customers, on that customer archetype, because that's going to help you scale. If you get pulled, you can add, uh, Dan said something interesting about Medallia. We started in uh, hospitality, right? Um, so, you know, Crossing the Chasm, uh, if you guys read that book, uh, I'm a big fan of that stuff. You know, it's, it's about finding your beachhead and then you can scale into, into other verticals, whether it's a vertical, 
or an archetype, um, the concept's the same. Stay focused on just that. And, you know, it's, 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 everyone knows this part of product is saying no to things that are interesting um, and, uh, and saying no to customers and knowing who your real customer is. And you have to be, you have to be this one because you're just so, so under-resourced. that you shared uh, that sort of a uh, uh, commandments moment uh, sort of early on in your journey. I'm curious though, did you go back and revisit that? How well did all those elements hold up? Was there anything that was maybe less critical or less relevant or something that maybe became even more important than you expected from the outset? Yeah. Um, so the thing with this is I, we didn't make this up. We just pulled it from the Lean Startup. So, it wasn't opinion driven, so I didn't have the ability to say, yeah, I don't like that rule. Well, tough, tough stuff, Stephen. Like, that's not, you know, you don't get that because it's proven. And, and, um, and so having that higher authority, not to use the Ten Commandments, no, having that kind of like, uh, that external validation that's not driven by me and, or, or other people's opinions, I can't just overrule them because that's just a developer who, who made that suggestion, um, uh, allow us to stay structured so we didn't change the rules, no. Thank you for a great talk. A uh, question about something that you mentioned at the very beginning, where you said you have a small team and then you start with ideation, completely from scratch, you know, give people a few days off. How did you get a team to begin with if you didn't have a specific idea or at least a, an area of focus? Um, so people who worked for you in the past? Or yeah. The team, the, when we sold uh, my travel company to IRAD, we actually sold the product, not the team. So, um, so it was the same team, and we, uh, we just started iterating from there. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Uh, so, a question is um, for consumer, um, or consumer aid um, applications and services. What would be your analogy to something price early Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a question of what your business model is, right? So if it's, if it's a content site and you're going to sell ads against it, um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to confirm a, a, a specific price point. If it's an app and you are going to charge, or if there's a premium thing that you're expecting to charge for, even if it's a website, um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta test that. You know, consumers, um, the beautiful thing about consumer apps now is there's Kickstarter. And you can actually get people to pre-buy your product. It's not even built, it's just a video using Kickstarter. I mean, that is the quintessential MVP. Um, and frankly, if you can't, you have to ask yourself, is it worth building? Because there's some pretty successful, you know, Kickstarter campaigns. Um, and, you know, that didn't exist you know, and it's kind of a new thing, you know, past three, four years before it's starting to get real scale um, uh, and notoriety. But, you know, for consumer, there's, there's Kickstarter. Um, and, you know, even with B2B, you can absolutely get customers to pre-buy um, pre a product or a feature. I've heard stories of customers, um, oh, sorry. Um, I've heard stories of customers um, uh, product teams early on, entrepreneurs early on, have a, have a um, basically use it as a funding mechanism. But they're early customers, they brought it in, and they say, oh, we need this feature. Okay, we will build this feature for you, but you need to pre-buy you know, a year's worth of thing, right? At a discount, 20% discount, and it'll only, it'll only happen if, um, if we deliver it, so I'm not, you know, you know you're just contractually agreeing that if we deliver the feature on spec, you will pre-buy a year's, a year's worth of licenses. Yes. Okay, great. Or no. You said this is the only reason why you're not using the product. If we deliver it, why would you not pay for it? Well, because, uh, okay, well, that's the real reason. So I'm not going to go scramble and figure out, you know, uh, how we build this thing for the next six weeks, deliver it, and have you say, well, there's another thing that I need. Because then you're just chasing your tail and you're not really moving forward. It's that three levels of escalation. At a certain point, the only level of escalation is money. Like, what is the reason that you're not paying me money to use our product? What is that reason? 
tell me. I'm, I'm going to be offended. Uh, please tell me. And, and, and if you don't ask that question, you're not going to get the answer. Customers are not going to willingly say, man, I am so excited to pay you. Just tell me where I sign. Like, you have to ask you know, for that order. I mean, it's like one of the, things, the first thing they say to you in, in IBM sales school is the number one reason that people don't close a deal, they don't ask. Yeah. Well, they, it's just they don't ask. They don't ask for the order. They're afraid of the rejection. And, and if you're building something, you know, even if it's, you're building something in a big organization, uh, you have to get comfortable with ha asking that question to understand early on what, what the value is to the customer. And it's not offensive. I mean, you can do it in a way that's it's not offensive or not threatening at all. You know, people, people expect to pay for things. I mean, they understand you've got to run a business. You know, it's okay. So, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, early and often. So, sorry, Adam. So, given that the uh, app approval process and the app distribution process is quite different, I'm assuming that the lean methodology is a little different for mobile apps. Is that true or is that, uh, what's your take on that? Um, no, no, I mean, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I think the, the principles apply for for mobile as, as as they do for desktop. I mean, the, the the fundamental principle is when you're setting up a test, um, you're doing when, early on. You're doing concierge MVPs. You're doing very basic stuff to test a single variable, a single value a, a value product, a single use case. Right. You're not building a full product yet that you have to push necessarily into into. Um, into the app store, right? And if you do, you can build something, you can push it in, and maybe you wait a, a week before app, Apple approves it, but then you, but then you go, right? Um, you know, the other secret is uh, if, if, it's, if, it's, if it's native, um, they have to approve it. If, it's, if you use like PhoneGap or something like that, and it's, H, it's, it's HTML5 underneath, they don't have. They don't approve it. They approve, they approve the initial app, and you just iterate real quickly, and you put, it's, it's, it's just HTML. It's just uh, web, mobile web. So, so even if you know ultimately you want to build a native app, early on, use like a phone gap or something like that. Uh, just build it in HTML, and you can iterate things really fast, and not and I have to go through the approval process. But you're still again testing a single use case, a single value problem. Um, so, um, user experience is all about building something that a customer would. Yeah, um, great question. And this is why I think people feel like they have to deliver a full solution early on. Because I'm not looking for them to continue to use the product. I'm looking for the reasons why they won't continue to use the product early on. I'm testing a single variable to understand if this is a needle moving variable for them, right? A single use case. Is this neat use case important enough for them? And if it is important, what do they need to solve to continue to use it? Why would they not continue to use this, right? Um, that's the customer discovery research I want to do before I figure out what the full solution looks like. And, and if you test five, six variables at once, you're not going to know what is causing the reaction and, or, frankly, muting out the reaction from, like, four things might be muting a positive reaction from, from one thing. Um, so, so you just have to be systematic of like, okay, this use case is important to this archetype, really, really important, but this archetype needs these three things to continue to, to, to fully, you know, to fully use it. If I deliver those three things, will you take another meeting from me? Will you bring, will you bring one other person to that meeting? Yes. What's your calendar look like right now? Right? Yeah. Would you have different? Would you whip up different designs focusing on individual features and show that to the customers? Yes, early on. Early on. Right. Um, obviously, that's not a product, not. But yes. what you're you're, you're testing because you don't want to. Um, so you know what you don't want to do is. Um, 
you know, I, I just I, I don't need to repeat what I just said. That's what you do early on because you, you want to test individual use cases. You don't want to build anything that's not powerful. It's not a needle mover. Even if the reaction is, yeah, this is cool, you know, uh, that's not what you're looking for, right? The, the thing you want to focus your early efforts on is that one killer thing that people just, they can't get enough of it, right? So the, the, the Twitter MVP we all know about, like the early Twitter thing, like it was such a simple thing, but that one use case was so powerful that even though people were tweeting out like early days what I ate for lunch, um, it was just engaging. People were coming back and coming back and coming back. And then adding pictures and direct message and private tweets and all these other things. Those are all great features. Right? And that will drive higher engagement. But the, the core of Twitter is just a, as a text message into the public. That's all it is. And that one use case is so powerful that even early on when it didn't have any of those other things, it was still highly engaging. People were coming back and they were putting that text message into the, into the web. That's all it was. Can you talk a little bit about the specifics of that? I'm still a little confused. So you ran an ad campaign uh, for a feature. You got response. No, for for a use for for, for, for use case. Yeah, use case. Yeah. Okay. So so a problem that's a problem statement. So you know very little about that person. They're inbound, and you got their email. Yep. You got your e they've got their email and, and maybe a few things. Did you then remarket the same people with the second feature? Or did you go back out to the yep. public? Because how did you get the? How did you unify that and find out what? your archetype was. You don't know that when they just respond. That's right. So what I was doing is, first thing I did was, uh, when I had that first meeting with them, I'd ask some questions like what company you work for and this and that, and I started, and I started bucking them into, into archetypes. Um, and then after that first meeting, they would say, yes, I, this is interesting, but I need da-da-da. And I'd say, well, if we deliver that, we can, can we set up a, we can deliver something for you to take a look at in a week and a half. Are you interested? Yes. Can we have a meeting? Yes. Can we schedule it right now? Um, uh, and can you invite your designer, or can you invite your teammate, or something like that? Um, and uh, and so that's how I kept going back to those same people, right? It's about engagement. It's the same concept that you guys do in your products on in repeat engagement. is is the same thing you do in the customer discovery phase. <coughs> so so the the, the uh, companies talk I talk to all the time. They go to panels or something like that, and and then they just keep going to fresh people. Well, that's not what you want out of your product. You don't have to get all new customers every single time. You want to see if your, if your customers that you currently have will, are, will stay engaged with you and continue to work with you. So now there's always a time to get fresh customers and test with a fresh set of eyes. Of course you want to keep doing that too, but you don't want to only do that. Um, that answer your question? Yeah. So this validates that some features are required by some customers. How do you validate market sizing? Yeah. It's worth doing this on a large scale. Right. So part of the archetype, uh, part of the archetype thing is that you, um, when you make a decision, as you put stuff into archetypes, you understand what that segment looks like. Okay. And you can start to say some segments are more attractive than other segments, right? So. Um, you might have a segment that is demanding your product, loves it, but when you take a step back, you're like, this is not a high income segment, they're not going to be, you know, I know they want this thing really bad, but I just don't think, or it's a really niche segment, you know, they want it really bad, but maybe you go after a niche early on, because those are going to be your early adopters, and they're just going to just love your product. Um, so, you, you, don't, you, do, you don't do it in isolation, is the answer, is that, is that the, the point of the process is to Look at feedback by by customer segment, and also take the bigger the macro view of is this an attractive segment for me to go after? And you can market size different segments, you know, using just regular research data that you find. Uh, some of the things are obvious, you know. Some maybe you have a product that's Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, right? It's just a product that's geared to those customers. A lot of companies have built you know great businesses that way at this price point. Enough market data. If they're really demanding it, let's go after that, right? Some are going to, you know, startups. You know, it's a product just for startups, right? Um, it's a tough segment. They come and go. Startups, you know, have a limited budget. Do you really want to, even if they're demanding your product and they love it and they'll stay engaged with you, do you really want to build a company that only serves to startups? Because you're going to be, you're going to have a high churn rate on customers. You're constantly going to be acquiring customers. Now, the startups, there's places to always go inquire them because there's incubators and stuff like that. So maybe you say, okay. But those are the kind of things you have. The point is, the point of this process is to make informed decisions. 
That's the, that's the point. You can't do that if your data, if you're not uh, segmenting your data by, by archetype. So this would be one last question and we can break the discussion. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, uh, my wife and kids are in New York. I'm here, I, I'll, I'll stay here all night, whatever you guys want. I love this stuff, I'm passionate about this stuff. I mean, I do, I do probably at least one meetup a month. Um, and um, so I, I love this stuff, I'll, I'll answer questions. Unless we get kicked out, sorry. All right, one last question, guys. Very cool. Okay, go ahead. So you mentioned about. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, you mentioned about um, the first ad you did was not successful, and then you changed it. Yeah. And how many customers do you have to put to start? Yeah, great question. Um, so consumer B two B is a little different. Um, I think B two B, um, you're looking for. I think you're looking for eight to twelve people in a, in a specific archetype that are actively staying engaged with you. Consumer, I think it's going to be a couple hundred in that archetype the, at the early stages, right? And obviously that's, that's pre-scale or anything like that, maybe 100, 150, 200, somewhere in there is, the, is what I've heard from, from people as far as where it starts to get validated and starts to really um, see, you know, see some consistent patterns. So B2B is you know, easier because, you know, you can build a personal relationship with, you know, eight to twelve people. Um, yeah. I don't know if we have time. Oh, cool. I guess my break. Everyone can leave. Yeah, because we do the raffle, and then everyone will stay. Everyone will stick around a long time. So anyway, first off, let's thank Stephen for an awesome. <laughs>